Thank you, David. And congratulations, class of 2017. I am so honored to be standing here with you today. And I hope, like for me, your years at Hamilton have brought you much joy. Hamilton is in my family. In a few weeks, I'll be ce celebrating my 30th reunion. My dad graduated in the class of 1953, and my niece, Hannah Jerome, will be graduating next year in the class of 2018. One of the greatest gifts I think this college offers is the gift of community. And the creation of a space like this service today where we can come together and listen to each other with an open mind and without judgment. Regardless of where you end up in life, I believe that the ability to listen openly and with compassion is a skill we all need to be effective in our relationships and to hopefully make a meaningful contribution in the world. One among many Hamilton professors who taught me this skill is Frank Anacarico. In his constitutional law class, when I was a junior, I was assigned to argue and defend segregation in a mock trial of Brown versus the Board of Education. I was completely appalled with this assignment. I grew up in a family that cared a lot about civil rights. One of my earliest memories was of my mother picking me up from preschool with tears running down her face and sitting with her and my dad all night watching the news about the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. So now here I was having to defend segregation. Professor Anna Carico encouraged me to put myself in the place of a segment of African Americans that, at the time, were fearful that they wouldn't be treated as equals in an integrated classroom and that their education would suffer as a result. To make this argument, I had to listen openly so that I could find a point of connection with those who believed in something that I did not. In the end, I was surprised that I was able to effectively represent this argument in the class. And that stands out as one of many, many significant Hamilton experiences that transformed my life. Unlike me, my dad, who went on to lead a consumer products company, did not have as great an experience at Hamilton. In the 1950s, Hamilton was not as accepting of religious differences. And my father was one of only a very few Jewish students at the college. And as a result, he wasn't welcome in many social circles and couldn't join a fraternity, which at that time was the central part of campus life. So he felt in many ways like an outsider. In fact, it was so unpleasant that his cousin, who was also a student at Hamilton then, swore to never come back to the Hill after graduation, and he never did. But from the moment that I set foot on this campus, I loved, loved this school. Compared to Manhattan, where I grew up, it was so green and everything was so beautiful, just like the perfect day that we have today. It was only years later that I learned about my dad's experiences at Hamilton. And I remember thinking, I can't believe he was actually okay with me going here. But my dad, who was a natural leader, had an incredible ability to listen openly. Rather than let his own experiences color what he heard, he was great at listening without the lens of judgment telling him what the answer should be. My dad was able to put himself in my shoes and essentially relive the Hamilton experience through my eyes. And in the end, he came to love Hamilton like I do 
And after I graduated, he stayed involved with the college, helping to run the Arts Council and worked on the opening of our beautiful Welland Museum. My dad's ability to really listen, to stand in the shoes of other people, and to change his perspective as a result made a very deep impression on me. So much so that in my first job out of college, I saw how a failure to listen resulted in a major failure in policy. I was working for an organization that helped women who were getting off of welfare find childcare for their kids so that they could go to work. This program was great in concept, but I quickly became incredibly frustrated. These women were super motivated to work, but for so many, the barriers of being a single parent and going to work were enormous. Sometimes the hours of the childcare we offered didn't match the hours of the job, or the transportation wasn't sufficient because the mom had to take three buses to drop her children off in three different locations. When we could get it right, it was great, but if my job was really to help people, I wasn't actually doing it eight out of 10 times. Despite everyone's great intentions, what we were offering was completely disconnected from what these women needed. If the people writing these policies were better able to listen to the women and hear what they actually needed to get out of poverty, the policy might have made a transformative difference in these women's lives. This revelation and my desire to figure out how to really help those most in need has greatly influenced everything that I've done since and the way that I approach my work today at the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation. Edna McConnell Clark is a foundation committed to giving disadvantaged youth a better shot at succeeding in life. Over the last 20 years that I've worked at the foundation, we've done our best to listen to what nonprofits need in order to thrive. Listening to them, we decided to make a radical change to our business strategy switching from making lots and lots of very small grants to making fewer but larger, major, multi-million dollar investments that can help make a transformative difference. Then 10 years ago, I became CEO of the foundation. And it was a really tough transition taking the helm. And I have to tell you, I, I was really scared I felt that I needed to prove myself, and at the beginning, I actually did not feel like things were going very well. Thank goodness an advisor encouraged me to get some feedback from my colleagues. And here's what I heard, and I can tell you that it hurt. My colleagues told me they felt disrespected by me because I did not hold myself to a schedule or meet deadlines. I was commuting extensively at that time, so my life was very, both personally and professionally, very unpredictable. At first, I was really defensive and dismissive of the feedback. I thought, okay, I'm the CEO. How I manage my calendar doesn't really have anything to do with anybody else. Like, what's the big deal? It was only when I stepped back and I took the time to listen openly without the lens of judgment that I understood how my behavior was negatively impacting my colleagues. They couldn't meet their performance goals or work effectively as a team because I couldn't always be relied on. Without realizing it, I was essentially undermining my own leadership. In the end, asking for feedback and taking the time to absorb it helped me to figure out what I needed to do to improve and become a better leader. And let me tell you, it, it's not easy. I've realized that listening openly is a skill that I have to practice every day of my life. Unfortunately, today, our society does not exactly prize listening. In this time of incredible change, especially demograph demographic change, 
I believe that so many of our global challenges are rooted in a failure to listen with compassion and a lack of tolerance for difference. So what does that mean for all of us? What does it mean for you as you begin your careers? How can you be great listeners at a time when nobody seems to be listening? Here's some advice. When you show up at your first job, you may feel many of your new colleagues are different than you. People will come from very diverse backgrounds. And because of the way that the world is evolving, they're going to be working mostly in teams. So when you find yourself in a place of discomfort because of difference, try to stay, take a step back and take the time to openly listen and reflect. What am, I, what am I hearing? Where can I find a point of connection? Bring your curiosity. Find out who your team members are and where they're from. Try to see their perspective. Try to find and appreciate the strengths that they bring. Starting from this place will make you a better participant and help you build a stronger team. Listening well also means being okay with changing your mind, your point of view, or even your business's entire direction. And it means not being able, not being afraid to ask for feedback and acting on it. Although really painful at times, it's the feedback that we get that helps us become better. So much of what we're taught about being a great leader is about proving ourselves and showing that we're right. But if you look around, our best leaders are those who listen really well and adjust and change in response to what they're hearing from their customers, their clients, and their colleagues. I'd like to close with some words from Pope Francis. Listening is much more than simply hearing. Listening allows us to get things right, to journey side by side, and put our abilities and gifts at the service of the common good. Imagine our world if everybody listened better and how we might together, side by side, be better at solving problems in business, in the social sector, and across the globe. On a personal note, learning how to listen has helped me become a better leader, a better parent, and has brought me much more joy. And it's also brought me back here today to the Hill, and I wish the same for all of you. Congratulations and best wishes, class of 2017.